Turn with us this morning to Matthew chapter number 5. Matthew chapter number 5. <clears throat> um, I'm going to read just uh, five verses this morning. We'll begin at verse number 38 and read through verse number 42. We desire your prayers. You've heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you that you resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if any man will sue thee at law, and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. Give to him that asketh thee, And from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. Father, we pray you'd open our heart to this truth. It may be fresh for some, it may be foreign to others. And so we pray for a newness of this truth in our own heart. We're trusting you for this as we alone have no power. None of us, we don't know what to do or how to do it apart from your direction and the spirit within us. Guide us now, we humbly pray, as we ask it earnestly, in Jesus' name, amen. We've been working our way through Matthew chapter number 5, and certainly many parts of this have been convicting to me and I hope revealing to all of us as we try to get better, and when I say better, I mean changing, becoming more like him and less like ourselves. Now, when I got to verse number 38, uh, if you were here Wednesday night, we preached up through verse number 37, but when I got to verse 38 and began to read those next few verses, they seemed foreign to me. And then I realized that it wasn't but six or eight weeks ago that we preached on these specifically. And I caught myself listening again to the Holy Spirit as it reminded me of what a foreign concept it is to the flesh for us to love without retaliation. To live in a way to where we don't have revenge in our heart. It was clear, and I don't believe it's coincidence, that having experienced something this week, and I'm sure everybody watched it on the news and heard about those things that took place, they were disturbing to all of us, and uh, part of us wanted to join in. But then we realized that what Jesus said was something completely different. And hence the battle, the warfare that exists between my flesh and the Spirit of God that abides within me. And I think I started, I really prayed about this, I started to skip this when I realized we had already been through it and then realized that no, we need it again. If ever we need it, we need it now. We need to be reminded that this world is not how we pattern our own lives and the examples that we live, but that we are different than the world. Different. We can think of the current affairs as context today. If you have any question whether or not that this particular gospel is applicable, just look around you. What the flesh wants more than anything by nature is to retaliate. One of the hardest things that you'll ever do when spoken harshly to is not to speak back. One of the hardest things for the flesh to do if having been hit on one side of the face is to turn the other. You may be far more far along or farther along than I am spiritually. 
but I have to confess that I think the flesh still struggles with this truth. And as we see it lived out, enacted before our very eyes, this week was just a reminder, right? Those kind of things have been going on in cities all across this country. And I think we need to be reminded again. I believe this is on purpose by God. I believe we're at this particular place in Matthew chapter 5 so that we can be reminded of our responsibility in this present world. Jesus says to them in verse number 38, he said, you have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. What he's referring to specifically was Exodus chapter 21. And, and the actual verse itself is much more extensive than what even is referred to in Matthew 5. He says in Exodus 21, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burning for burning, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. Now, if you just take that one verse and you pull it away from the context in which it was given, you might also think that it a pattern for you to live. You might also take that to mean to you that it is all right, it is acceptable with God, it is expected of God that when you lose an eye, that you expect an eye from the one to whom you lost it. Hand for hand, tooth for tooth, burning for burning, foot for foot, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. If we take it just as it's written out of the context that Moses had given it in and we simply apply it to our lives as a single verse extracted from all of the verses around it, you'll find yourself in the same position that the Jewish people did. They had allowed themselves to be pulled into a response just like the rest of the world. I assure you today that it is human nature for a man to want revenge. It's natural. It's a normal part of humans. When we have been wronged, we want to be made right. And being made right is an expectation that as I suffered, that person that caused me to suffer will suffer as much or more than I was made to suffer. Aren't we filled with that notion? That when we're hurt or when we're broken or when we're wronged or when we've been done wrong, that what we want is retaliation. What we expect, and even here they pulled this verse from the Old Testament and, and they said to themselves, well, Moses said, an eye for an eye or a tooth for a tooth, a wound for a wound. If you've hurt me, then I have an opportunity. I have the right, the privilege to hurt you back. And yet what Jesus is saying is this is not true. It's not true. And too many today take liberties with the word of God and try to make it mean something that it does not mean. You say, well, what did it mean? According to the Old Testament, what Moses was doing was establishing for the magistrates of that day a limit to where the law could go with restitution to someone who had been wronged. Or in other words, what he was saying to the judges, to those to whom a wrong would be taken to. When you hear somebody come and say, this man, he has wronged me and he has cost me this or he has hurt me in that way. What God was doing was giving Moses a limit saying, look, when you judge them, you can only give an eye for an eye. You cannot take a man's life for an eye. You can't take a man's life for a foot. If this man has been wronged in this way and has experienced this particular harm, then you can only retribute in that same manner. That's what he meant. Had nothing to do with revenge. It had nothing to do with retaliation. It was God's way of telling Moses, when you judge other people, then you have to put a limit on that judgment. You have to balance that judgment. That judgment needs to be fair. This particular verse, that's its very purpose, was to establish the mandate for the court system of the Jewish people that when someone come and said, I've been wronged of my brother and I have lost my eye, the judge could not say, well, you deserve to die. No, 
What judgment was is an eye for an eye. Whatever he lost, you'll repay that in full. And yet the people had taken this particular verse to mean that it gave them, a, it gave them permission to be vengeful. Everything that I know about Jesus Christ, not one thing suggests he was vengeful. Not one time. Of all the things that he went through, not one time do I find Jesus, who had every right, who could have in every way, sought revenge for the wrongs that he had been done. And yet not one time did he seek retaliation. Not once. We hear Jesus say in verse number 39, but I say unto you. Listen up now. When Jesus says, I say, we need to be understanding what is said. He said, but I say unto you that ye resist not evil, but whoso shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the left. If any man will sue thee at law and wants your coat, give him more than your coat. Give him your cloak also. If any man will, will compel you to walk a mile, he said, walk with him too. All of these things are foreign to our nature. All of them are absolutely foreign to what we want to do in the flesh. If you mind the flesh when you are wronged, the first thing you will do is retaliate. The first thing you'll do is to mind your own pride. And you'll go in a way that most go even in the day that we, listen, people are living in lawlessness in the society that we're a part of today. They are living in a lawless condition, sometimes condoned, sometimes not. But regardless, they are living because they are vengeful, they are seeking redeem, they are retaliating by destroying and destruction. And all of these things represent human nature in its best form. These are things that Jesus said were wrong. They are wrong and they've always been wrong. He's never condoned a lawless response. He's never condoned a vengeful. Jesus said, vengeance is mine. Now I can assure you that whatever's coming to somebody, they'll get it. If they don't get saved and redeemed and set free of that sin, there's a penalty coming and God does not overlook or miss any sin. There's none swept under the rug with God. There's none not recorded. There's none he doesn't know about. He knows more than you who those are that will receive judgment in that day. But let's be clear. What Jesus requires of you and I today is not a lawless response based on the own revenge of our hearts, but he expects us to love our neighbor. Even more so, verse 43, to love our enemies. To love those that don't love us. To love those who purposefully would abuse us. Now, some say that what this means is is there's no place for self-preservation. And I don't believe that's what he's saying at all. Right? Somebody comes into my house, I'm going to protect it. As best I can. Right? It doesn't mean that I just move over and say, yeah, take my wife. Take my children, take my stuff. Now, what he's saying is, is that when there is a wrong that is done to me, then I have a responsibility to recognize that the response will be contrary to my own flesh. When I have been wronged in a way that causes my own heart, right? And you'll fight this just like I fight this. There is a desire to have revenge. There is a desire to retaliate and to respond in a way that is not like Christ, but that is like the world. And people will condone this and say, well, they got what was coming to them. They deserved what they got. All of these things we can rationalize in our mind, yet when you take them to the cross, you'll not find any time that Jesus actually did this. Had he done this, you and I would still be lost. Had Jesus responded to those that had done him wrong the way that he had responded, if he had given back to them what they had given, we would all still be lost. Jesus suffered as none will ever suffer. And when we recognize our responsibility, the importance to respond 
as Christ has responded, he said quite clearly in one of the hardest right out of the gate, he said, if somebody hits you on one cheek, turn to them the other. Now, I don't know about you, but it's going to take a stronger man than me to do that. Stronger. Stronger in what way? Stronger in their weakness and their willingness to be meek. Let's be clear. Meek is not weak. Meek is not, is, is, is not apathetic. Meek is not unattached or disinterested. No, meek is motivated by love. It's motivated by forgiveness. How many of us, instead of wishing ill to our neighbor, would wish them good? He goes into that, and I don't plan on preaching that again, but we heard it in, in Matthew 5 as we started the Beatitudes, how clear he was when he said, Blessed are they who love those who would revile them. Blessed are they who, who love them instead of hate them and retaliate against them. Blessed are they who love their enemy, who serve instead of being served. Blessed are they who when all manner of evil is set against them, instead of being revengeful and retaliatory, they give themselves to serve someone else. Is that not the example of Jesus Christ? Yeah. We find ourselves challenged with these truths. We find ourselves as, as, as human nature, right? We get sucked up into some of the things that are going on and we recognize the common call to fight. But let's be clear. When it comes to the things that are going on in the world around us, are we called truly to fight? Now, I want to give you two sides of this so that you understand where we ought to be. As children of God today, I have a responsibility to stand against sin. Right? Just because somebody lives in sin does not mean I acquiesce to it or allow myself to be drug into it. I stand against sin. Now, you say, how do you fight? Well, number one, I've got to stand. I've got to stand but stand doesn't mean that I live in revenge. Stand doesn't mean I live with an expectation that I am going to retaliate against them who have done me wrong. Let me read us the scripture this morning. Ephesians chapter number 6. He says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be, may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. How many of us realize that the devil uses his own people to create his own snares? All of the, many of the things that come against us, the enemy will use. Sometimes he uses God's people to, to, to work against one another. Sometimes, if he can, he'll cause the body of Christ even to schism, to divide among itself, and to begin to seek revenge one over the other. I say unto you, children, this is not the way of God. And for us to be like God, we're going to have to become meek and recognize that when we seek vengeance of another man, we are not Christ-like. Yeah. We're simply saying, I and the judge, I should be the one that decides what is right or what's wrong as, as concerning recompense to me. I get to do what I want, and yet all the while we want to look to the cross and say, but be merciful to me, right? When I deserve nothing from Christ but his vengeance yeah. and his justice, I deserve nothing from Christ but hell Right? We want that grace. We want that forgiveness. We want that patience and we want that long suffering for God. And yet in our flesh, we're unwilling to give it to a fellow man. That's retaliation. It is not of God. It is not of God. What's our response to be to this world? Well, we must stand. Now, He's equipped me to stand. There's something inside of me that's greater than everything else in this world. He's given me an armor. And being fully clothed with that armor, I can withstand the wiles of the enemy. He's not asking for me to lay down. He's not asking me to move away or, or, or to move aside. He is asking me to stand. Now, when you stand in this world, you'll be buffeted. The people of this world who know not God are just like you were before you knew God. 
And they will buffet you. They will persecute you. They will revile you. You say, how do you know? Because Jesus said so. Jesus said, if they did it to me, they'll do it to you. Jesus said, if they hated me, they'll hate you. Jesus said, if they buffeted me, they'll buffet you. These are things we know. We're not, we're not ignorant to the devices of Satan. We understand that his snare is to bring us to a place where we allow pride in our own heart to seek vengeance among a world that needs mercy. It needs patience. It needs long-suffering. That is the message that ultimately changed the hearts of people. That's the message that brings a soul to recognize that what Christ came to bring was not judgment, but forgiveness. Is when we look at another and say, I forgive you. When we look at someone else having smote us on one side and we offer the other. When they say, go with me a mile, and we say, I'll go with you too. There's multiple ways to look at this, but we have to stand. But what does it mean to stand? What does it mean to truly stand? Ephesians 6, put on the whole armor of God that you might stand. 1 Thessalonians 5 says, abstain from all appearance of evil. Ephesians chapter number 4, neither give place to the devil. James chapter 4 verse 7, submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Clear, right? Clear that there is a responsibility that I have to stand against the sin of this world. But what does that mean? If he's told me to abstain from the very appearance of evil, to stand against the wiles of the devil, to to submit ourselves to God and to resist the devil, then what does that mean in light of Matthew 5 and 39? Where he says, resist not evil. Clearly, the point Jesus is trying to make in Matthew chapter 5, verse 39, is that when we are done wrong, we are not allowed to be vengeful. We are not allowed to retaliate. That doesn't seem fair. Let's talk about fair. Right? We, we always want to talk about fair. And yet we forget that what Jesus did on the cross was not fair. Everything that he did had nothing to do with what I deserved. If I had got fair at Calvary, I would have been the one on the cross. We want to talk about fair when it's convenient to us. We want to talk about fair when it means retribution against our enemy. We want to talk about fair when it means that somehow someone suffers because they caused me to suffer. That is vengeance. And Jesus said, vengeance is not yours. Vengeance is God's. Yet it's terribly difficult, isn't it, for us to extract ourselves from the natural natural man and to put ourselves in a place where we say, to God be the glory. Yeah, if Jesus had been fair on the cross, you'd have been lost. You'd have went right straight into hell. Not one person would have had an opportunity to be saved. So what right do you ever have to say, I deserve anything? No, no. Christ has already proved and set for us the ultimate example of forgiveness. Instead of retaliating when they spit upon him. Instead of retaliating when they mocked him. The king, the king, they mocked him. Scripture says he could have called legions of angels at that very instant. As he hung there suffering for you and I, yet what did he do? He did not open his mouth except to say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Is it not true that most of those that were offended by, they're simply blind? Most of them are lost. 
Most of them today do what they do in, in simply response to the nature of their own flesh. And all of these things we did before, and we were just like them. We're no different except we've been brought into the light and made new through Christ. We ought to be different than this world. Different. So what does it mean when he said resist not evil? It means... Romans 12, verse 17, that we recompense, recompense to no man evil for evil. Think about what the Apostle Paul is making clear to those in, in Rome. He said, provide things honest in the sight of all men. Recompense to no man evil for evil. You'll find it multiple places throughout the New Testament. First. Thessalonians chapter 5. See that none render evil for evil unto any man. The response to evil that is done to us is not to in turn give evil back. And yet that is the first temptation, is it not? The first temptation is for us to open our mouth and respond in vengeance. And yet all the while Jesus is saying, whosoever smites you on the right cheek, turn to him the other side. If they sue you at law and take your coat, give him your cloak. If they compel you to go a mile, go two. Instead of retaliating, what Jesus is saying is to do something absolutely foreign to the understanding of every lost unbeliever in this world, and that is love your enemy. Surely you're not sitting there this morning checking that box and say, I got that one. That's easy for me. I have no problem with vengeance in my, in my flesh. I have no problems with wanting to be righted when I'm wronged. I have no problem with wanting someone to suffer because I have suffered because of them. I have no problem with, we lie. Human nature causes us to want to rise up in pride and to cause our own selves to be defended. And yet all the while God is saying, let me defend you. Don't defend yourself. When I say to you, resist not evil, what I'm saying is don't put yourself into the place of the judge. You cannot judge, nor will you ever be able to judge. You're not capable of judging. You're not all-knowing. You're not all seeing. You don't understand all things. You cannot look into the life of another person and discern whether one thing is right or another thing is right. What's important is that we recognize that we render evil to no man that has given us evil. We're a challenging subject. See that none render evil for evil unto any man. I don't know. Don't raise your hands, but I'm going to ask the question. How many of us have done it? But how many of us, when somebody with a sharp word come out and just attacked us, and we turned right around and opened up our own sword, and out of our mouth from that, that, that awful and evil tongue began to curse back? You say, well, I deserved it. I'll tell you right now, what Peter found out was that that tongue, that very thing that caused him to deny Christ, gets all of us in trouble sometimes because motivated from hatred, motivated from vengeance, motivated by something from the nature of the flesh, it will cause us to say things that you can't get them back. Say hurtful things and vengeful things. <laughs> See that none render evil for evil. So the question then as we close, uh, well, let, let me just give context. You're going to get hurt, right? There's no question about it. You're going to be hurt. That There's people in this world that don't love you. As a matter of fact, you're hated by a large majority of this country. We're going to be under attack as men and women of faith, believers, because they think us to be narrow-minded and judgmental, bigoted, because we believe one way is right. 
And the world won't understand that. The lost of this world, they don't understand that. They never have understood that. And just because we've experienced a time, at least in the history of our own, own, own new, new country, we've experienced a time where there's, a, there's freedom to worship as we want to. I can assure you that does not, that does not eliminate the, the enemy, the haters, those that look at what we believe. And they say, if you don't believe that homosexuals are, are, should be allowed in the church, if you don't believe that living any ungodly, perverted lifestyle is okay and normal and should be accepted, then you're wrong. And you're the hater. And you're the bigot. And you're the ones that are narrow-minded. Right? They're going to come and they're going to say that. They already do. But what do we say? How do we respond? Isn't that what Jesus is trying to get them to? He said, you've heard an eye for an eye. You've heard a tooth for a tooth. He said, but I say unto you something completely different than what you've heard. I say unto you that when they strike out against you, that you don't respond in like manner. I say when their words are sharp and hurtful, that you love them. In return. See, the question is, what's the greatest power? What is the greatest impact on another human soul? If you respond like they respond, does it not confirm to them that there's nothing to Christ anyway? If you're just like them, if you respond like them, if you fight like them, what's the purpose? Christ who and why? If you're no different than the heathen of this world, shame on us. Shame on us to respond as if we've not been given forgiveness totally. I'm going to heaven not because I deserve it. I am not going to heaven because I figured out a way to get it right. I'm going to heaven solely on the mercy and grace of God who by bringing his son in the place of my judgment paid for my sin. I get to go free when what I deserved was judgment and hell. What the world needs as a transforming truth is when they smite you on one cheek for you to turn to them the other and to recognize that what you're doing is because there is a power in you that is greater than everything that is in this world. So how are we to fight? Second Corinthians chapter number 10. I want you to listen to this verse very carefully. Second Corinthians chapter number 10, verses 3 and 4. He said, for though we walk in the flesh... Cannot avoid the fact that your human nature will want to respond in an ungodly way. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Listen to what he said. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Don't miss that. So how am I to fight, preacher, with my tongue? No, that's carnal. How am I to fight this with my fist? No, that's carnal. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. How, pray tell, pastor, do I fight then? He said, the weapons of our warfare are mighty. What's he saying? That my battle is not in the flesh. It's with the Spirit. Do I fight? Yes. But I don't fight in the flesh. You see, that's where we take it upon ourselves. We say, I know what to do. I know what to say. And we mess things up worse. And we call somebody that's already an unbeliever to unbelieve more. 
because we can't live like Christ. And yet he's calling us to live godly. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. How do you think Jesus defeated it? He defeated death by yielding to it. And once he was in there, he destroyed it. I get to go to heaven because Jesus didn't fight on the cross with his flesh. But in the spirit, when he said, it is finished. He gave up the goal. He, Jesus had to surrender to death. He had to yield to death in order to conquer it. Though we live in the flesh, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty, they are mighty, through God to the pulling down of strongholds. What weapons? All right, so we'll close with this. What weapons do we have? As men and women of faith, believers who walk not in the flesh but in the spirit, what weapons do we have? What battles are we fighting? I want to go to Ephesians again, chapter number 6, verse 12 and 13. He gives some clarification. The Apostle Paul said, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. All right, again, going back to what Paul just said in 2 Corinthians, he comes back in Ephesians and he said, our battle is not against flesh and blood. And yet ultimately, isn't that what was going on this week? That's what's been going on in our country and cities all across this land, the lawlessness all of that, that ungodly activity was based upon the flesh. The flesh. And here we find, he said, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against what? Against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. We have a battle, yes, are we to fight? Yes. But we cannot fight the way the world fights. Or we are no different than the world. What a detriment to our testimony. That I would fight just like the enemy fights. No, what Paul's saying is I've got a whole lot more power than they have. Can they smite me on the cheek? Yeah. Can they accuse me and falsely accuse me? Can they hurt me with their tongue? Yes. Can they do all kinds of evil? Can they sue me? Can they, do, can they make me walk with them? Am I, yes. All of these things are things that can happen. All of these things are hurtful. All of these things are a part of the battle. And yet what he's saying is, is when you fight, you must fight in the spirit, not in the flesh. And I assure you, Fighting in the spirit is way more productive anyway. What does it accomplish when any of us respond to evil with more evil? Not a thing. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Right? People died this week. Is our battle against flesh and blood? No. Nah. No. Nah. Who is our enemy, ultimately? We know who he is, don't we? Do we not know? Are we, we're not ignorant, he said, to the devices of Satan. He's told us to be sober. He's told us to be vigilant. Not a vigilante. To be vigilant. In what? In knowing what our enemy does and why they do it. But we have a responsibility Yes, to stand. Yes, to fight. 
But if that fighting involves your hands, if that fighting involves your tongue in an evil for evil circumstance, if that fighting involves you being the judge of another man's soul or what they get in retribution for a crime done to you, then you have missed the mark. Wherefore, take unto you, he said, the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. Are we to do something? Yes. Do we sit by idly? You better not. Right? And that's what people think it means to be a Christian is that you just don't do anything. No, on the contrary. I should be doing the greatest thing of all. I should be fighting this fight in the spirit. Praying. Living in a way that the power of God and the word of God is effectual. All right. Romans 12, 21 as we close. Apostle Paul said, be not overcome of evil. Be not overcome with evil. But what did he say next? Right? He didn't leave it there. Is he saying give up? No, he said be not overcome with evil. He said, but overcome evil with good. What? Surely, surely that's not the way. It's foreign to our flesh, isn't it? But is it not what Jesus did? Is it not the supreme example of Christ dying for sinners? He said, be not overcome with evil. No, you have to stand. But he said, you overcome evil with Good. I don't understand. Then I'm going to take you right back to Matthew chapter 5, verse number 39. If your enemy smites you on one cheek, turn to him the other. Overcome evil with good. If they take and sue you at law and they take your coat, give them your cloak also. Overcome evil with good. Right? Isn't that what he's saying? If they compel you to go a mile, go with them too. Overcome evil with good. The word's clear. There is a response, but it must be spiritual. There is a response that should come from the people of God. Come get a song if you would. Here's what some of you are saying, right? Here's what the flesh is telling you. You can't defeat your enemy until you've got a gun as big as theirs. Right? That's, what we, that's how we think. And if this is happening to me this way, then I, I need to at least be able to retaliate with the same. Right? You got a nuclear weapon? I've got two. That's how we fight wars, isn't it? Our guns are bigger. Or we've got more of them. And yet what Jesus is saying is that none of these things are the way to win. I know it's completely contrary to the way we think. But isn't everything Jesus said that way? He said if I was going to be the first, I had to be last. He said if I was to live, I had to die. There was a paradox in everything that Jesus did. Why? Because the spirit is opposite the flesh. It's not the same. We got to get this. We got to get this. 
these babies ain't got no chance unless they know how to fight. Paul, my gun's bigger. I promise you. He's bigger. They ain't got nothing on him. Nothing. Nations fall. It's just a word from my captain. Need I be afraid? No. But I do need to remember that my weapons are not carnal. My weapons are mighty through God to the pulling down of the evil strongholds of this world. We don't need to know how to fight like, a, like the world. That's natural. right? All you got to do is respond in an instant and it probably was wrong. We're going to have to learn how to fight this one because it won't be won with our tongues or our fists. It won't be won with our guns or our troops. It won't be won with anything that is earthly in nature. The only way to win this war is through Christ. Now I'm asking you to join up. I'm asking you to start fighting. I'm asking you to commit yourself to pray. Pray. Engage in this battle that is spiritual. Our country is at a, at a crossroads. Our future, the freedom of Americans is at stake. And you're wondering what to do. You're wondering how to help. We know. The weapons of our warfare, right? The weapons of my warfare are mighty through God. To the pulling down of every evil stronghold of this world, there is none like my God. I do not fight this in the flesh. I must fight it in the spirit. What enemy can stand against the prayers of the saint? None can stand against him. None can stand. Now's not the time to lay it down. Now's the time to really get to fighting. To fight the way we're supposed to fight. In the Spirit. Praying. Overcoming evil with good. We know the way. Altars open. If you need the Lord, come pray. But let's be obedient in our hearts to God and surrender right now. And say, I'll pray. I'll fight. I'm equipped. I've got the armor. I can do it. We need everybody to pray. We need everybody to pray. There's a lot at stake. It's time to pray. It's time for us to fight this fight. Every one of us. It's not the preacher's fight. It's everybody's fight. We've got to stand for God. We'll do that on our knees. Stand with us if you can. You need the Lord come. Mm-hmm.